We live in such a sedentary culture, right? Where we're spending eight, 10, sometimes 12 hours a day sitting, staring at our screens. So we're living from the neck up and many of us have lost touch with the wisdom and the intelligence that exists in our physical bodies because simply we're not moving enough. And as someone who's been a Nike athlete, fitness is a big part of my life. Movement is a huge part of my life. I see very clearly when I am moving consistently, I have access. It's like a channel opens up where there is so much intelligence and so much insight that has not to do with my logical reasonable brain it has to do with another plane and when I don't I get up here and it all gets twisted and then I'm unclear so if you are facing an opportunity a possibility to say yes to a job a speaking engagement a date who knows it could be any realm of life and you're not sure whether you should move ahead with it here's what you need to do get to a place where you're quiet nothing's around make sure that there's no technology and I would invite people to close their eyes while they do this so ask yourself does the idea of moving ahead with this of saying yes to this make me feel expansive or contracted. In the nanosecond after you ask yourself that question, your body will have a physical response. Need motivation? Watch Top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Marie Forleo and my take on her top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. So let's walk through what yeah, expansive. Everyone who's listening and watching right now, do this with us. Yes. Yeah. So expansive, and I'll just give some um, possibilities, but yours might show up differently. So expansive may actually be as though your shoulders are relaxing and your chest is opening up. Expansive may feel like even your physical body is moving ahead in space. Expansive may feel like a twinge or a tingle of excitement or joy or anticipation even if the notion of this feels intimidating to you or like something you've never done before. There is a lightness, a moving forward, a ever so subtle visceral yes, whether it shows up in word form or merely through the movement of your body. That's expansive. Now let's look at the flip side. If you ask yourself this question, does the idea of saying yes to this make me feel expansive or contracted? And in the nanosecond, after you ask that question, you find a pit in your stomach or a sense of dread, or your shoulders kind of hunching forward, or even your body just shaking back in space or your head saying no. That's your intuition trying to save your butt and tell you don't move ahead with this. And here's why this is so important, Jay. Mm. Because often when we're faced with an opportunity that our ego thinks we should move ahead with, right? Um, either there's a significant amount of money on the line or some type of opportunity that we feel will give us an edge, something beyond the competition or put us on a level that we're playing in a field that we're like, yeah, now we've really made it. And it looks good on paper, mm -hmm. but something inside is like not right. That's when we need to listen to this most and use this test because I don't know if you've experienced this, when you override those little feelings of dread, even though everything looks so cool on paper, that's when we get ourselves into trouble and get off track. Rule number two, get specific and consistent. Why do we stop doing the things that we all know are good for us, especially when we've been able to make the time before? It's a head scratcher, am I right? Now, obviously it makes no logical sense, right? But then again, we know that we human beings are not logical creatures. We are emotional and often irrational when it comes to our behavior. Now, the truth is there are a gajillion different reasons why many of us stop doing the things that we know are good for us. Some people just get bored, right? Some people rebel against any kind of structure or authority, even if it's themselves. And some people get off track, like if their schedule changes or they travel or somebody gets sick or something like that. Now, as a coach, I'm usually not a big fan of why questions. First, because in this format, I can't talk with you. I can't get to the root of your specific situation by asking you more questions. But more broadly, why questions can sometimes encourage a little bit of navel gazing, right? And they can easily spiral into beating yourself up, thinking that you suck, or that you're just not built to be consistent and disciplined, all of which is not true. 
So I think a better, smarter, and more helpful question is, how can I be more consistent in doing the things that I know make me feel good? Or how can I set myself up to win the vast majority of time? Now, those questions are questions that we can tackle. Plus, how questions really aim your brain towards the solution, right? Rather than the problem. That's our everything is figure outable philosophy in action. But before we talk about the how, I do want to make something very, very clear. April, my love, you are not bad and you are not weak for falling off the wagon of being consistent. Virtually everybody I know does stuff like this, including me. That's because we are human, right? We have this vision sometimes of these perfect meditators who meditate twice a day every day and never, ever miss. Or we hear about people like Jerry Seinfeld who write a big X on his calendar every day he writes a joke and that he never breaks his streak. But guess what? Even Jerry Seinfeld doesn't do this. On a Reddit Ask Me Anything, he actually said, this is hilarious to me that somehow I am getting credit for making an X on a calendar with the Seinfeld productivity program. It's the dumbest non-idea that was not mine, but somehow I'm getting the credit for it. Point here is, you do not have to strive to be this perfect person who does something every single day for the rest of your life, unless that kind of thing really just floats your boat. Now, that said, there are some systems that you can easily put in place to make it easier for yourself to be more consistent on a consistent basis and some behavioral science that can really give you an edge. Step number one is choose one practice or habit, not 17, right? So I love that you mentioned all the kind of things that we like to do in our morning practices. So journaling, exercising, all kinds of things like that. And behavioral science tells us that if you want to be successful in terms of forming a new habit, it is best to focus on one habit, not five, not 10, and definitely not 27. So I'd encourage you to ask yourself out of everything that you could do that feels good, which one habit or one practice is going to give you the most bang for the buck, given what you want to experience at this stage and season of your life. So is it riding your bike for those 20 minutes in the morning, or is it something else? Take a look inside and then choose one. Rule number three, use your life to the fullest. The average human lifespan is absurdly, insultingly brief. Assuming you live to be about 80, you have just over 4,000 weeks. Oh, I mean, did that hit you in the gut like it hit me? 4,000 weeks. I don't know about you, but to me, that does not seem like a very long time at all. Now, assuming that the vast majority of people watching the show right now are like you, meaning you are not an infant, that means you've already blown through quite a big chunk of your 4,000 week allotment. That is a sobering wake up call. Am I right? And you know, I think many of us have been experiencing what I call the great reassessment. I mean, we're still in this global pandemic, right? Our entire lives have been turned upside down and many of us do not want to go back to the breakneck pace of the before times. In fact, I think a lot of folks are reassessing their lives and asking themselves some very important questions like, How do I want to spend my time differently moving forward? I mean, do I really want to be on my phone for hours a day looking at social media, people trying to convince you how great they are? Do I really want to keep working these punishing 10 to 12 hour days staring at a computer screen as though I'm going to get some grand first prize hustle trophy at the end? Or will I ever get to write that novel or learn that language or take more trips or spend more time with my family while they're actually still alive? I got to say, from my perspective, the great reassessment is actually this magical window of opportunity to make some long overdue changes. So with that in mind, I'm really curious. Where are you in terms of the great reassessment? Has this been on your mind lately and in your heart lately? And more specifically, when you think about this notion that on average, in total, you get about 4,000 weeks to live and you've likely already lived a significant portion of that, what specifically do you want to do with the time you've got left? I mean, are there some important dreams and goals that you really want to prioritize? Or are there some unhealthy patterns and habits or even projects or relationships that no longer deserve your time or your energy? 
Now, I don't want you to just think about all this, right? I don't want you to keep this in your head. I want you to actually write your answers down in the comments below because writing it down is a part of what helps you make anything real. Because guess what? Whether you've got 2,000 or 200 weeks left, I'm here to challenge you to be courageous and intentional about how you use that remaining time. So here is your three-part question for this week. Question number one, what's the one thing that you're doing right now? Not because it's true to your heart, but because you feel it's expected of you. I mean, maybe you're doing something out of habit or obligation, but secretly you know that it's time to move on. So that's question number one. Question number two is, What's one courageous change you want to make to be more true to yourself in terms of how you spend your time? What's one change that would make you feel great about how you're using the remaining 2,000 or however many weeks that you've got left? And then question number three is what's one action step you can take right now to start making that change happen? So do you need to make a phone call? Do you need to have a conversation? Is it something else like signing up for a class or booking a trip? Doesn't matter what it is, but I want you to write it down, make it clear, specific, and actionable. Rule number four, start before you're ready. When I was first training in terms of wanting to be a coach and becoming a coach, um, it was so much in terms of personal development work and it was awesome. I loved working with clients. I was like 23, 24 years old. And not only was I helping folks try and get results in their own life, I was also doing this work on myself. And one of the things I realized was that defining myself as a coach, first of all, that never really quite felt right to me. It felt very limiting and narrow and not quite on. But I admitted that I had this dream to dance. Now, let's set some background. No dance training whatsoever. Never taken a formal dance class in my life. (laughs) And it was like I was around 24, 25, which sadly in the professional dance world, it's a little over the hill to start, right? right? That's a very, very late start. And anyway, I finally got real with myself that I wanted to do this. And so I started taking professional dance classes in New York City. And it was amazing. I found myself coming alive and coming alive. And this was great. And so I I, um, was taking class at Crunch Fitness. And my teachers were like, you're actually really good. And I remember, Jay, I was literally like, are you talking about me? I was like, wait, wait, like, I don't have any technique. They're like, no, 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 you should really consider start teaching. And I was like, yeah, which given the fact that previous to that, I had, you know, failed on Wall Street, I had failed in the magazine industry, I had had all these failures. And I was keeping myself alive, quite frankly, because I wasn't earning a lot of money as a coach by bartending and waiting tables. So the fact that someone thought I was good at something was that just little grain of like, oh, you are kind of good at something. It was great. Cut to. I said, all right, I'm going to try out and become um, a substitute teacher at Crunch. I'm going to teach these hip hop classes. I had no idea what the hell so I was cool. doing. You're so cool. <laughs> so Love that. Uh, it was just sheer passion, right? And I was just doing everything I could, just trying to make it through. One of my first classes ever that I taught on my own, someone came up to me after class and she said, you're really good. And I was like, thank you. That means the world to me. She's like, you know, I work for MTV and we're working on a new show and we are looking for a choreographer slash producer. You should come in. And Jay, it was a moment, like this was my first real class ever. Again, so like nervous and awkward and unsure of myself. So what came through my head? You're not ready yet. Mm. That was like, I was even praying. I was like, universe, why did this have to happen? I am certainly not ready. I'm not good. I don't know what the hell is going on, but this is an amazing opportunity because I grew up on MTV. Yeah, so I couldn't say no, right? Because again, I could hear my inner clock going like, girl, you're not getting any younger, so you might as well say yes. So I said yes to this opportunity. And I remember standing outside of the Viacom building in New York City the day before I was like, when I was about to go up for this interview that afternoon. And Jay, I wanted to throw up Like I was so nauseous. I was so not ready. Like I was actually thinking, should I throw up in this like metal trash can or should I like go inside and go to the bathroom so that I can clean myself up before I actually went to the interview? So I went into the building and um, I stood in front of the boss's door, the, the, the person who I was going to interview with. And I like shook myself out and I just said, you are not ready, but you're going to start before you're ready because it's an incredible opportunity. And no matter what happens, you're going to feel good about yourself that you just went for it. And I went in for that interview and I booked 
the job. Wow. And so it was this experience of me putting myself into kind of this whole world that I was in over my head. So let's be clear. I was working with dancers that had decades more experience than I did. They were talking about dance terms that not only could I not perform, I didn't even know what the hell they were, but I made my way through by showing up as professionally as I could, by being honest about my inexperience, but also by bringing my gifts that I did have to the table. And that one opportunity, dancing and choreographing and producing for MTV, that led to fitness videos. That led to this increased learning curve where I got to learn basically three to four years worth of experience in like three months, which eventually led to me choreographing commercials for Reebok and then eventually becoming um, one of the world's first Nike elite dance athletes, all because I was willing to start before I was ready. And every single area of my life, I still do it in business to this day. There's so many things I say yes to that I'm like, somewhere in the back of my mind is like, you're not ready yet. And I'm like, that means I got to go. <laughs> that means I got to strap myself in and go like, we're doing this. I will learn as I go. Yeah. So this idea of starting before we're ready, it doesn't mean that we're irresponsible. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that we don't do our research. And it doesn't mean that we override our intuition that if perhaps, you know, there was years ago, and I'll say this, that people approached me to write a book yes. and I legitimately wasn't ready yet, but it was because my focus was in other areas. Mm -hmm. Oh, I had other priorities. I knew from a deeper level, it wasn't about the fear. It was about trusting my own timing. Yes. But when you know you want to do something and you're clear that this is your path, using the mantra, start before you're ready is an amazing way to beat procrastination, mm -hmm. to leapfrog over your fear and to get going. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five, activate your imagination. There's a prompt in here that I have used so many times in my life and so many times in my business that has transformed everything. In a business context, it's led to like multi-million ideas. And in a life context, oh my goodness, I can't even tell you how many things it's helped me shift. And it all comes back to tapping into that wisdom that I already have in my heart that I wasn't really aware of. So what you're going to need is a journal or just a notebook or a piece of paper. And I want you to give yourself at least 50 15 to 20 minutes of uninterrupted time with no cell phones around, no things ringing or dinging, no televisions, no nothing. I just need you to put yourself in a place where it can be kind of quiet, where you're really comfortable. Maybe you have a little cup of tea or a cup of coffee or something stronger if that's what you're into, whatever floats your boat. And you're going to use this sentence stem to start to unearth what Ellen might really want to focus on in this next chapter of her life. So the sentence stem goes like this. Wouldn't it be cool if dot, dot, dot. So I want you to write down on the paper, wouldn't it be cool if, and then whatever springs up in your mind and your heart, I just want you to write it down. So wouldn't it be cool if I lived in Hawaii? Wouldn't it be cool if I could solve world hunger? Wouldn't it be cool if I had platinum blonde hair? I don't know. I'm just making stuff up off the top of my head. But what this exercise does is it starts activating your imagination. It starts dusting off that ability you have to dream that I suspect may have been put on the back burner for so many years because you've been focused on so many other people because you're so responsible and you're so loving and you're such a good person. But now, my friend Ellen, now is the time for you to rediscover what's in your heart and what would really be cool for you to focus focus on in this next chapter. And I promise you, if you play with this prompt, wouldn't it be cool if, and you let yourself dream without editing, without squashing something down because you feel like, oh, that's impossible. That can never happen. No, we don't do that in brainstorming. We let everything down on the page. I promise you, you will start to unearth something that's going to make you go, ah, 
that feels amazing. Could I really do that? Could I really be that? Could I really pursue that? And you're going to get like little tinglys. Arms will stand, the arm hair will stand up, all that kind of good stuff. But it will only happen if you give yourself this ability to play with this prompt and do it until you can't write anymore. Rule number six, reinvent yourself. My question, how can I go about projecting myself as a writer first and a teacher second? What business steps can I take to make this transformation? Thank you for all you do, Christina. All right, so Christina, we got some good answers for you today. There's actually three very simple, very effective things that you can do right now to make that transformation and make it happen fast. The first one is speak it. So words have tremendous power. All you gotta do next time you find yourself at a cocktail party, just say you're a writer first. Um, so anytime you introduce yourself, talk about writing, talk about your books, talk about everything else before you start saying you're a teacher and that's gonna make a huge difference. So um, what we like to say is just do it. Just do it. Just do it, Christina. Number two, number two, you want to write it. So all language that goes out into the world, think about this. What does your email signature say? What does your business card say? What about any social media profiles? The very first thing that you should have is ding, 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 writer. So if you don't have writer as the first thing listed on all of your written paraphernalia, go and make that change right now. I'll wait. Do it? Did you just do it? Okay, good. Um, number three, and this is the most important one of all, is be it. You have to write as much as you can. So if you don't have a blog, I would highly suggest you start blogging. Perhaps journaling will be more your thing, but just really be the writer that you actually are. And it becomes pretty simple if you're doing something habitually, you're writing every day, you're putting out blog posts, you're publishing more books. Naturally, it's gonna be the first thing that pops out of your mouth. Rule number seven, find your inner wisdom. Many of the times what stops us all from figuring something out is we're afraid, right? We're afraid maybe we won't be able to do it or we're just afraid of the area that we need to walk into in order to figure it out. And then people often have asked me, you know, well, how do I know the difference between healthy fear that would be very good for me to move through versus my intuition or a gut instinct or a hunch going, no, 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 <laughs> that's actually going to be a shit show, right? Like, yeah. or that's just going to be, it's, it's something you should not do. And that's a really important question. Here's what's awesome. You don't need to go asking other people for the answer. You have all of the wisdom you need inside of you. Rule number eight, get clarity. Once I got back from the Everything is Figure Outable tour in the fall, I immediately started cranking on this idea for a program that would help people transform their entire relationship with time. I had this Google Doc with like 50 pages of notes and ideas. Then, of course, the pandemic hit in 2020 and everything in my world got put on ice. So cut to the fall, and as many of you guys know, I learned I had to have this urgent hysterectomy. And then after I recovered, I was like, oh my goodness, now I know I really need to create Time Genius like now. But then I wondered to myself, is this just me who feels like I am done with these crazy, unrealistic expectations in terms of all the stuff that we're supposed to be doing, like all the time. Am I the only one who feels like this 24-7 hustle culture is not only dumb, but totally dangerous? Now, as you probably know, I'm very good at trusting my instincts. But before I was about to invest an enormous amount of my personal time and my personal energy, not to mention my team's time and energy, creating this whole new comprehensive experience from scratch, I wanted to make sure that I was creating something that could genuinely make a difference to our people, which means you. I mean, were other people hungry for a new way to work and live? Was everybody as disillusioned with the culture of busyness as I was? So we sent out this survey to find out. So I asked, what's your single biggest struggle when it comes to productivity and getting things done? And then I asked this, if you could ask me any question about this topic, what would you ask? Now check this out. In the first three days, we had over 7,000 incredible responses. I spent days and days and days reading through all the answers. And honestly, what people shared brought me to tears. It became crystal clear right away that this wasn't just me, right? There are literally thousands of you that are feeling like all this overwhelm and this busyness and this pressure is not only exhausting, but it's unsustainable. 
Now, once we got that survey back, that's when I knew, right? That was my 100%. This is what I'm going to do. I am so clear. So the next step was for me to fully commit to the number one thing that I wanted to focus on for the rest of the year. And as I teach in Time Genius, clarity is key to accomplishing any big dream because it allows you to blissfully ignore the endless new opportunities that are going to keep coming your way. Rule number nine, be happier. I think it's so important. And honestly, the place that we've all been right for the last 18 months, and we don't know how much longer until as a global society, we can get the pandemic behind us. We don't know where we're at with that. And uh, for me, having a joyful life. It's like we work so hard. Everyone listening right now, they work so hard to take care of their families, to take care of themselves, to try and do their best by their community and all the people that they have responsibilities towards. And sometimes I've experienced this where it's like, you're exhausted. You're burnt out. You just feel like I've got nothing else to give. And I'm like, this is not how we're designed to live. There's like, what's the point? Do you know what I mean? Of working so hard, even if you're making great money or you're making an impact, if you're, you yourself aren't happy and joyful, if you're not having a good time along the way, it's all for naught. Again, I get really obsessed with those end of life studies. And, um, Because people tell us, right, we have this incredible data and research from thousands of souls who have gone before us, who have reached the end of their life, and they have insight and wisdom to share. And almost all of them said, I think it was maybe like the third or fourth regret, this is Bonnie Bonnie Ware's uh, The Five Regrets of the Dying, the top five regrets of the dying. Almost all of them said, I wished I allowed myself to be happier, I wished I allowed myself to be happier. And when you really stop and think about that, and I'm paraphrasing a little, they might have not gotten the the words perfectly right, but that was the essence of it. I allowed myself to be happier. And Evan, I don't know, have you experienced this? Have you ever gone through periods in life where you you put your head down and you worked really hard and maybe you stressed out and you're like, gosh, that was done, but it wasn't that enjoyable. I mean, I Mm -hmm. certainly have, you know, tortured myself. I just was so tight and so constricted. And I realized I'm like, All of these different little seasons of my life, when you string them together, are my life. So if I don't train myself to bring joy to as many moments as possible, it's not always going to happen. And there's some really crappy hard things that happen in all of our lives. So this is not about being no toxic positivity. This is not about being unrealistic. But there's many times throughout my day where I'm like, I could be enjoying myself a lot more, right? Like if I'm working on something... I can bring that party to whatever I'm doing. And oftentimes, especially when there's those tedious tasks that we all have to do, whether it's emptying your dishwasher, doing the laundry, pipe breaks, right? And you have to clean something up. These are the things that all of us go through. Your car breaks down. Something unexpected happens and you're like, oh my goodness. You can either go handle that from a place of being just angry and upset and complaining and beating yourself or the world up. Why is it like this? Or I've decided I'm like, as much as humanly possible, I want to bring the party, which means I'm going to turn on some music. I'm going to laugh at myself. I'm going to laugh at life because stuff happens that you don't expect. And it can either be a show or it can be like, you know what? This is life. So I might as well have a good time with it. And I think one of the experiences of being a time genius is to also prioritize what brings you joy. So is it laying in the grass and staring at the clouds? Is it allowing yourself some non-guilty time on the couch to watch your favorite Netflix show? Is it being with your dog or with your kids or cooking a meal or just reading a great novel? I think that uh, we did research with our audience, Evan, and we have responses from, I think at this point, it's over 15,000 folks about how they feel about their time. And I was so struck by how many people feel guilty and feel like they're not productive enough the moment they slow down and try and take a rest, that there was no joy, that they, they didn't even feel like they deserved to feel joyful because any time that they kind of looked away from work, they had this overwhelming thought that they should be doing something more productive. So the reason for me to emphasize joy and time genius is not because it it works, but it's also because it's so necessary. I don't want to see any of us, myself, you, anyone who's turning, tuning in right now. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips is keep going. I think all of us have to, you know, we need to give ourselves permission to have those bad days because we all have them. You know, people often ask me, they're like, you know, you seem so confident all the time and you seem like you have everything together. And I'm like, well, you don't see me when I'm 
struggling. Like, Mm. you know, I'm like on the phone with a friend going like, I don't know if this is any good or I don't know if X, Y, and Z is working or, you know, kind of those things that we just do in in private, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. So I think knowing that all of us have bad days and you can be like, oh, this is the worst. But to answer your question, I think it's understanding that we have the power to assign any situation, either an empowering meaning or a disempowering meaning. Mm-hmm. So let's take a really simple example, right? So we're not going to get too heavy. We're going to do it just right on the surface yeah. because sometimes that's easier to see like the juice example. Totally. So let's say I am a first time writer and I've sent out my manuscript and I got rejected again. I can take that very neutral fact and assign a meaning or a story to it that says, well, I'm a failure. No one likes my and I should just give up and I should stop being a writer clearly because here's another rejection letter. So that is what I would categorize as a disempowering meaning. You're not going to feel good. You're probably not going to take a productive, effective action from that state of mind. And you may not ever reach your ultimate dream of being perhaps a published writer. You could choose to assign that same neutral fact an empowering meaning, which could be, and we can come up with tons of them. Maybe it's like, you know what? Every rejection means I'm one step closer to success because I'm actually getting my work out there. And if I'm getting my work out there, that means that I could possibly be published. You could assign an empowering meaning like this. That particular article or story wasn't right for that publisher. They're not rejecting me. They're rejecting the work. Let me go find another publisher that might be aligned with this particular story. You could also make it mean something like this. You could say, you know what? I remember that J.K. Rowling got rejected 12 times, and I think Stephen King's carry got rejected like 30 times. I just need to keep going and build up even more rejections. And this isn't about being Pollyanna. It's understanding the power that we have of perception and our ability to assign a meaning to any fact that presents itself to us. And I think there's something interesting. There's this great quote, life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. Chuck Swindle, right? Mm -hmm. Pastor. I love that because there are going to be hard truths in all of our lives. And I feel like the only thing that we can control is how we contextualize what happens and therefore how we respond Mm -hmm. to what happens. Does that answer that question? That definitely answers that question. I, I love the multiple ways in which you gave of rewiring that same thought with different meaning and stories. Well, it, I think that's... It forces us to be creative, right? Totally. So it's like we have to challenge ourselves to see the same exact thing from multiple points of view. One of the things, um, we'll talk about this a little later, but I also love showing people... Um, optical illusions where you can see multiple things in the same yeah. exact lines or drawings because it proves that we can all look at the same facts and have a completely different interpretation, yes. which therefore proves that the situation is not what is bad or good, but the labels and the context and the stories that we lay on top of it. Totally. I was bartending at night, waiting tables, doing assistant work. Like I was basically working 24 seven, you know, in the evenings and weekends, it was all, how can I just make money to pay my rent and put food on the table? And in the days I was really working my buns off, trying to create content, create a newsletter, get coaching clients, actually start working with people. And, um, when I got engaged really young, I was about 23 years old and the guy was a sweetheart, but I realized pretty quickly, I didn't want to marry him. This was not the person I was meant to spend the rest of my life with, but we lived in this tiny one room studio in the West Village and our money was already co-mingled. And so I was terrified because I felt like I made this huge mistake. Here I am trying to become a life coach and clearly I have a lot to figure out about life. Um, I knew I needed to get out of this relationship, but I didn't I didn't know how to untangle what I had created, this big mess. And so um, I knew once I broke off that engagement, I needed to actually physically leave that environment. That was the only way I was gonna get to move on. And so I called my parents in New Jersey and I said, I, I hate to say this, but I have to move home. I was so upset. I just felt like a total failure. I felt like a horrible person for breaking this guy's heart. And it was just, it was a mess. Like I just felt like such a failure on every single level. The fact that I couldn't support myself yet, the fact that I had to go back to Jersey, the fact that I felt like I, you know, did a number on this guy's life. And um, it was really humbling, but you know, 
uh, at the end of that, it made me realize I'm more committed than ever to figure out what it takes to make my life work and then also to be able to share those lessons with other people. So hopefully they didn't have to go through <laughs> the mess that I created. If I could save people a learning curve, that was gonna be awesome. And I think I was home maybe like two or three months, something like that. Emotionally, I had to heal and just kind of get myself resituated and you know find a new living, um, a place to live in the city and get back on my feet. But it was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me because it got me regrounded in my own power and made me realize that if everything falls apart, which it sometimes does, there's always a way to get back on your feet. As I approached the gate, I knew I needed to get some work done before hopping on that flight. And I was bracing to try and find one of those like long vertical outlet hubs where there's 30 people clustered around trying to plug their stuff in. So to my very pleasant surprise, I found rows and rows and rows of these comfortable, cute little workstations, all with their own outlets, and a huge sign above it that said, the juice bar. I mean, seriously, how many times have you said to yourself, oh crap, I ran out of juice on my phone, or my computer has zero juice, I need to go find a plug. So when JetBlue says juice bar, they are speaking my language, and it's a very smart play on words that lets me know, hey, they get me. And I gotta tell you this, every single customer wants to feel like you, as a business owner, just get them. Now, another quick example, uh, when I saw the help desk, right? Instead of saying something formal like information desk, the sign said, just ask. So not only is the latter more friendly and inviting, but it implies that my question is welcome and not stupid. So the bottom line is this, using your customer's language is key if you wanna create more sales and raving fans, and in the words of this tweetable, your customer's language is the jet fuel to make your business take off. Everyone asks us from the time that we're like in our kind of mid-teens and when you start thinking about, you know, what you're going to major in and where you're going to go to college and what you're going to do, it's like, what do you want to do when you grow up? And it's this question that I think is really intimidating. First of all, because when we're young, we might not have that answer yet. And in my case, there were a lot of things that I wanted to do. I remember having such a passion for dance, although I never took any formal dance training until I was like in my mid-20s. I loved dance. I was passionate about fitness and health. I loved spirituality. I loved reading. I loved business. I actually thought at one point I was going to be an animator for Disney. So I think that part of my own challenge and my struggle was that most of the world was telling me that I had to pick one thing. And all this conventional wisdom was like, if you're gonna be a success, you have to narrow down, pick one thing, specialize in it, and be the best at that thing, and maybe in like 10 or 20 years, you're gonna be awesome. And every time I tried to follow that conventional wisdom that told me to pick one thing, I felt like I was cutting off a limb. Even when I you know, tried to just pick life coaching, and I was like, I'm just gonna be a life coach, I felt horrible. I felt terrible when I decided that I was actually gonna give dance, which was hip hop dance and, and fitness a go, thinking like, okay, I'm just supposed to do this. Just doing that, I felt terrible thinking I was putting life coaching on the back burner. And it wasn't until I realized that I am a multi-passionate person, I am multifaceted. There are a lot of things that I'm not only interested in, but I'm actually good at, and I need to give myself permission to do everything and just run away from the conventional wisdom, that's actually when I started feeling good about myself, and that's when I actually started getting traction in the world. And when I say traction, I mean started getting better projects, started getting paid more, started actually building skills that now are crucial for my business. The most accomplished and respected people in the world stay humble. They're curious, they're open-hearted, they're lifelong learners. Don't ever feel like you have to overcompensate for imposter syndrome by becoming an arrogant asshat know-it-all. Not only do you not have to know it all, but you become extra trustworthy when you say these three magic words, I don't know. You know, I consider myself a forever student, and I happily admit when I have no idea what something is or how to do something. But you know what? Everything is figure outable. So not knowing doesn't make me a fraud, and it doesn't have to make you one either. And vision is great. Some people have amazing, huge, big, grand visions, and they love it, and they step into it, and they rise up to that occasion, and that's awesome. Like if that's you, and that's how you're built, and that's what works for you, 
rock on. For many people, when they have an enormous vision, it paralyzes them. They have no idea how to accomplish it. I see people cry in workshops all the time. It's so big, I don't know how to do it. I wanna change the world. I'm like, don't worry about changing the world, change one person's life. If we can focus there, stay there for a little bit, we're gonna to get to that thing, maybe. Otherwise, it's all good because you're still doing the work that you were born to do. I always had a dream to have an amazing company that didn't necessarily have one home base. Um, I'm fascinated by technology and for me it's about finding the right people who also believe in that same idea that you can do great work, that you don't necessarily have to share the same physical space all the time, but that if you're united behind a vision and behind values and behind um, wanting to do incredible work in this world that you can create amazing results and only see each other a couple times a year. So for us, it's really about making sure that whoever comes onto the team shares the same beliefs that we do, shares the same vision, cares about making a difference, and also is really self-motivated. You know, just because I'm the CEO of my company, everyone else in the company is very entrepreneurial. They might not wanna run a company themselves, but they're self-starters, they're completely motivated, they're always looking for ways to solve problems, they have an attention on the bottom line, and they wanna create huge change in this world. We honestly don't think about our own mortality enough. I think death is one of those taboo kind of topics in our culture, and we don't really face it. We don't think about it. We don't talk about it enough. We don't imagine ourselves dying enough. We don't really just dive in. And one of the weird little tricks that I use on myself, especially when I'm just being horrible in my own relationship or I'm being not the person I know I'm capable of being, I'm having a temper tantrum, I'm stressed, I'm just being an ass, whatever it is. I've used this in my relationship with Josh where I will literally fast forward to the point where like I imagine him laying in a coffin and me going, why were you such an asshole? Why didn't you take that time? Why did you let that fight go on for four hours or a day or whatever it is? Or in those moments where I feel myself tightening up or shutting down or withholding love, I try and check myself before I wreck myself. I go, there's gonna come a day where you're gonna flash back on this moment and wished that you just gave him a hug or wish that you went in and said, I love you. It's coming for all of us. So if you can remember that now, you change everything. When I was first starting B-School, I was really excited about getting it out into the world. And I went to a marketing conference to network and to meet people and to find promotional partners. And so I was really excited to tell people about the program. And I was on this escalator heading up to like the first session of the day. I was really excited. And there's this guy in front of me. And you know, at conferences, everybody likes to introduce themselves and learn about what you do. And so this guy looks at me and he uh, looks at my name tag and goes, oh, you know, what do you do? What are you doing here? And so I, I started telling him about B-School school, this online business school for women entrepreneurs. And his face kind of went blank and he looked at me and he's like, oh, that's cute. Do you expect to make money with that? Do you have a, a rich husband who's bankrolling you? And I was so stunned that this guy said this right to my face. Meanwhile, the truth was that I was supporting myself in my own business for almost a decade at that point. I had already been making quite good money and no, I did not have a rich husband. Um, it took everything in me not to wanna really deck this guy and throw him off the escalator, but it was probably one of the moments that fired me up so much because this guy saying something so rude and so chauvinistic to me all it did was get me more fired up to prove him and anyone out there who underestimated me, underestimated me completely wrong. I was believing that if I didn't work constantly that I wasn't a worthy person, that I wasn't doing enough to make my business successful, that I was perhaps letting people down. And so I had to really shift that and understand that, you know, I, I come from a background I don't come from a wealthy background, so the work ethic in my nuclear family is very strong. Like my, my dad owned a small business, my mom, um, although she stayed home with us, she was constantly doing stuff, constantly working, constantly fixing things, constantly doing things mm -hmm. that took care of the family. So that's the kind of DNA I grew up with, was like 
no, if something needs to get done, you get it done. Yeah. It's not like you sit around all day and eating bonbons and watching TV. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so that's kind of how I got there, but then I really, I had to readjust if I actually wanted to not only have a successful business, but have a successful mm -hmm. life. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. If you want to see the last one on one I did with the amazing Marie Forleo, check it out right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. Most of us exist in this space of endless comparison, the compare and despair, right? So we have either these idealized versions of ourselves.